webinar uh, sessions here. Usually I'm being interviewed by somebody else. And now I've decided in my initial uh, interview here to uh, to see, to test my skills, whether or not I, I, I can do this, whether I know what I'm doing. Uh, my, my great temptation, of course, will be to talk over everybody, think I'm right about everything and not let anybody get a word in edgewise. So uh, hopefully that will not happen. But anyway, uh, I'm very excited today because we have two guests with us today. We have first uh, Father Robert Imbelli. Oh, and he sent me this lovely bio. And I, I it, it's gone away now. See, I'm, I'm goofing up already. All right. Uh, Father Mbelli is a priest of the Archdiocese of New York, taught at St. Joseph Seminary in Dunwoody. I didn't know you taught at Dunwoody. That, that's fantastic. And uh, Mary No School of Theology before spending 30 years teaching theology at Boston College. Particular interests include Christology and spirituality, which, of course, are inseparable now living in the New York priest retirement residence, but helping uh, Sundays in parish. You still seem to be going strong, Father. I hope, I, I hope I'm as spry and as great at your age as I'm already 63 and I feel like I'm half dead. So, uh, you know, between the arthritis and the senility, I'm not certain. Uh, so, so uh, but we're here to, and I'll get to the other guests in a second. We're here to discuss Father Imbelli's fantastic article, uh, essay on Vatican II called Remembering and Misremembering Vatican II that was in Church Life Journal, which is an online journal, which I highly recommend. It's out of Notre Dame. It's run by the irascible Arter, Arter, Arter Sebastian Rosman. I'll give him a plug. And we'll be discussing the main themes of that today. But also with us today, my for, I'm very happy about this, my former colleague, uh, my best friend, my everything at DeSales University, Dr. Rodney Hauser, professor of systematic theology at DeSales. We made uh, quite a duo during my time there. Uh, it was kind of known as the Larry and Rodney show, I think, by some. <laughs> Bill Portier called us that, Dr. Bill Portier. Uh, but anyway, uh, Rodney got his PhD at Marquette University. And what year was that, Rodney? Uh, 98. I, oh, you, uh, I defended oh, 98. Oh, you barely remembered. That's good. Okay. 1998 Marquette University. And he did his dissertation as I did mine on the theology of Hans Urs von Balthasar. And Rodney is professor of theology. I said at DeSales University lives in Allentown, Pennsylvania with his wife. And so I say a big thank you and a welcome to both of you for being here today. And I feel uh, underdressed. Father is in his uh, clerics. Rodney has a nice sport coat on. And uh, I'm just, this is going to quickly become known as my uh, podcast and interview shirt because it's the same shirt. I, I think I have, one, I have one nice shirt and I wear it in every one of these things. Some of my more observant viewers will know that. All right. So the article is called, let's, let's launch right into it. Remembering and Misremembering Vatican II. But before we get to the actual meat of the article, Father, I'm going to start with Father Imbelli. And of course, now, Rodney, you can jump in at any time, too. This is very informal. If you want to interrupt me or whatever, feel free. But anyway, <laughs> at, uh, I would like to know, Father Imbelli was a seminarian studying in Rome while the Second Vatican Council was going on. So he's not only a theologian, uh, he's also got personal stories to tell with Ray. I just want to know right off the bat, especially for our listeners out there who are too young to remember that era, what was it like to be a seminarian in Rome while the Second Vatican Council was going on? Yeah, I have the great fortune of uh, being there from the beginning. Uh, I arrived in Rome in uh, the fall of 1962. Uh, there, there's a providential twist, which I should mention in passing, uh, that I was sent from uh, Dunwoody, where I had spent one year. In those days, it was called Second Philosophy, which was equivalent to senior year of college. Uh, and then after that year, three of us were chosen to go to Rome, which meant going to North American College. Right, uh, right. But due to some what I call Felix culpa, happy fault, uh, <laughs> there was no room at the inn for three. They could only take two. And so not to disappoint the third, um, the rector of Dunwoody at the time knew of this Collegio Capranica, which, uh, as I found out later, is supposedly the first seminary in the world, founded 100 years before the Council of Trent. Uh, so <laughs> rather, than being, uh, rather than being Tridentine, I call myself pre-Tridentine. <laughs> 
Uh, but that was a, a wonderful experience living at this Italian college, uh, college meaning residence in the center of Rome uh, mm -hmm. and having a, a mostly Italian uh, uh, residents, uh, some of whom attended the council as sort of factotums. Right. Uh, and they would come back uh, at the end of the morning session uh, and report as to what had happened. So there was a great excitement in the air. Uh, and to see the gradual opening of ecclesiastical Rome during the four sessions of the council, uh, people went from uh, wearing cassocks to wearing clerical shirts. Now, mine is rather conservative. It's black, but they had them in... Uh, <laughs> green and uh, rosé. Oh, and, I uh, remember all the pastel colors uh, right. from my, my youth in right. the 60s and 70s when all the priests started wearing them. Right. But one, one, one further historical point, which I think I mentioned in the article, uh, is that day in November of 1962, when the uh, uh, council fathers voted uh, not to take up the schema on Revelation, uh, at the time, uh, the initial schema, as you know, was called a fontibus yes. revelation, uh, coming out of the uh, uh, theological commission headed by Cardinal Ottaviani. Uh, but they did not have the two thirds that would have been necessary to not discuss it. And that's when John the 23rd intervened. And the result was the wonderful constitution on Revelation, De Verblum, which yes. was only passed at the last session, I believe. Oh, yes. And, and thank you for correcting me on that point, too. In my original blog on this, I said that it, it passed, but it didn't have the necessary two thirds, like it was trying to beat a filibuster or something. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you corrected me and pointed out, no, no, it didn't even pass. But in right. order to get sent back, see, this is something a lot of people wouldn't know. It didn't pass. It didn't even get 40% of the vote of the fathers. And we're going to get to why in a second. But not only that, but it had to have, what, a two-thirds negative vote in order to be sent back for revisions? Otherwise, what would have happened to it? It would just would have, it would have been discussed, but to no end? Well, presumably. Uh, and even Congar, there's a wonderful quote that Congar has in his journal of Vatican II saying, in effect, he said, I couldn't believe that this was happening. And that really became the new beginning of the council, the real start of Vatican II on the Constitution on Revelation. And as you know, I, I've maintained that, you know, of the four constitutions, in, in a way, De Verbum is a primus inter pares. Uh, I think that uh, unless right, right. you acknowledge that God has revealed God's self in Jesus Christ, then there's no foundation for anything else. Yeah. Rodney, you want to say something on that? No, yeah, I was, I was not that long ago reading, you know, young uh, Cardinal Ratzinger's, uh, you know, well, he wasn't Cardinal at the time, Joseph Ratzinger's uh, musings <laughs> on this. And I think he's six and he was of the same. He was very, very disappointed in the thing that came before them, you know, that was done by Ottaviani. It was, he said it was written in that old neo-scholastic style and it was very curial. It was very Italian, you know, very Roman and uh and it just seemed like oh dear this is a <laughs> this is it <laughs> you know this is, there's nothing going to happen you know, they were all excited that something was going to happen and this just seemed like the same old same old and he was very disappointed but but apparently i guess it was paul the or i'm sorry john the 23rd who intervened so that this wouldn't be as as, as you put it larry in, in other words it took a Two thirds refusal of the thing to get it sent back or something like that, and it didn't quite right. get that two thirds refusal. Right. In other which words, is really a weird way of voting. <laughs> in other words, yeah, you guys, have, we have to really hate this in order for it to get sent <laughs> yeah, back. Right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> which is yeah. really bizarre. If we just sort of mildly hate it, okay, we're going to go ahead and talk about it anyway, uh, even though we're not going to approve it. I think, I think that's. I might be reading into this, but I think that's a hysterically Italian way of doing things. You know, we're just yeah. Unless we really dislike it, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna revise it. But all joking aside, all joking aside, um, this this is a really interesting historical point, and I have read some of the original schemata that that had come out. Uh, most of us who have studied as scholars Vatican II have at least taken the time to read some of them. Now I haven't read. All of them. How many 
How many different versions of Dei Veribum were there, Father, before we get to the to the final one? Do you know off the top of your head? I would say at least three and maybe four. Uh, but as you know, what, what John the 23rd did, in the, you know, aside from breaking the rules, which he right, had you know, right. the opportunity, the power <laughs> well, to do. He's, he's the Pope. <laughs> he constituted a new commission, uh, which was right. not just the Octaviani Theological Commission, but joined with the uh, uh, Cardinal Bea, you know, on the, the uh, who... I don't know what his group was called now, uh, but it was, you know, it was working on ecumenical affairs. And so mm -hmm. it was that joint commission which then produced the uh, Dei Verbum. Um, you know, my, my friend, uh, fellow diocesan priest, a great historian of Vatican II, uh, Father Joseph Kermanchak. Oh, Kermanchak, uh, yeah. Has translated all of the schemata and uh, we've been encouraging him to publish them because uh, they're not available in English, you know, in any comprehensive way. Well, hence why I've only read some of them, because I didn't have <laughs> my my Latin is is OK. I did study it in seminary, uh, but it takes a while. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll just read some of these, <laughs> which I have. But anyway, um, Rodney, did you want to say something about that? You look no, like no, I, I, you just look like you were, I don't want to put you on the spot. You look like you were on No, no, I, I actually did I I actually had a comment that I thought of and now I've probably forgotten it. Um oh it seems to me maybe and, and I could be corrected here that some of the Belgians were involved in that second commission, you know, under Cardinal Bea, uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. I think maybe uh I think Ratzinger mentions that also in his highlights of, of Vatican II or whatever. But I had a question if I may, Larry. And that oh, no, is, no, no. Feel free. Feel free. Yeah. And, and this is to Father Mbelli. Um, First of all, by the way, uh, happy belated birthday, because I, I a oh, that's right. friend of all of us, Angela Franks, uh, wished you a happy birthday on Facebook, I believe, yesterday or the day before. I don't know which way, day it was, but but anyhow, happy birthday. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. But, here, but here's my question. Um, what is the chief difference between you know, the final outcome of Dei Verbum and, and this first uh, schema. Um, Good question. You know, yeah, like what, 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 cha what was the difference, I guess, I, I, it would be the question. I, you know, I, I think, I mean, following other people, uh, that what Dei Verbum has is a much more personalist and experiential approach to revelation uh, than the old, you know, and not, 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 not to, you know, always harp on this, but the old neo-scholastic approach was much more propositional, uh, philosophical. Uh, and, you know, as we all agree, it's not that there's no place for that. Uh, right. But what the Verbum does is, I think, is we cover, you know, this, this personalist approach. Uh, there's an old Italian proverb that my mom always used to quote saying that the, the, old, the old man, the old lady didn't want to die because there was always something new to learn. Uh, so for years, <laughs> I think that um, Dave Ablum is the primus inter pares of the constitutions. But what I've recently come upon, and this may be through reading of someone else, was that the beginning, the, the prologue to Dave Ablum itself. So if Dave Ablum is, if you will, you know, the, uh, the leading document of the council, then the prologue of Dei Verbum is, in a sense, the prologue to the whole council, the whole document, the whole document. And you remember what the prologue is. I mean, it's basically a quoting of First John chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. You know, what we have seen and heard, what we have touched right. with our own hands, it's that which we proclaim to you. And it struck me that if that is the prologue to the whole council, then the whole council has to be read in this experiential, personalist way. So that, you know, as I've said before, when I say that uh, uh, the, 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 the great achievement of the council was what I call race source ma, but with a capital yes. S, by going yes. back to the unique source, who is Jesus Christ, then uh, people might say, well, gee, didn't Chalcedon do that? Well, sure it did. But it did so in a much more philosophical, uh, thematic way, whereas Vatican II does it in a much more personalist way. And therefore, and this hooks up with you know what Larry has been saying for so long, uh, 
I think it's the vindication of the whole race or smart school, which called for a new integration of theology and spirituality, uh, right, which right. means that it's an experiential appropriation of the faith and not merely a rote recitation of propositions about the faith. So again, to be overly simplistic, it's not just about Christ, but rather it's an invitation to encounter Christ. Yeah, I, I think that's fantastic. Uh, one of the things, one of the disconnects for me is when I when I read the documents of the council, or when I first read them, you know, in my youth many years ago, I was struck by how personalist and experiential they were. They didn't read like normal encyclicals or normal ecclesiastical uh, magisterial documents. There was uh, there was a personality in these documents. I found them I found them uh, beautiful. I found them inspiring. So there's now a disconnect when when I read a lot of the critics of the council, especially say from the traditional swing of the church, that it's it's a gobbledygook, it's a word salad, it's riddled with ambiguities and it's uh, verbose and all that. I just I find all of that criticism just to be so out of place and for all the reasons that that you just said. Uh, the old deductive scholastic method certainly had its place, that propositional method, but Vatican II had its place as well. Rodney, do you want to say something? Yeah, no, that's all. That's uh, really good stuff. And I, I totally agree with Father Embelli that Dei Verbum is the the treatise of the council. I mean, I think everything else has to be read in the light of that. I think that's super, super important. But I also think that it it it, it signals this change of tone, um, which is we're no longer only going to talk to insiders, right? So obviously there's an advantage right. to scholastic um, accuracy and precision, and, and, we and we need that, right? But we also have to um, be able to speak to ordinary people in a, a language that's kind of immediately appealing to their experience. And if you read you know, I was reading the, you know, the uh, uh, divine office this morning and I, in the, and the, it was um, Basel the Great. Yeah. And, uh, and I was reading that and I was thinking, this is like, it was written yesterday. It, it was, it's so beautiful. It's so to the point. He has this great confidence that every human being wants to encounter Christ. He just, he just, it's, he's just, well, of course, everybody wants this. It's just, you know, yeah. we're going to help you figure out how to do it. You, you know, there's yeah. a confidence yeah. that everybody, you know, that everybody yeah. wants Christ. And then there's just a freshness to the language. It's very evangelical language. And, uh, and so to go back to the race or smart piece just a little bit, um, I think it's precisely in going back to the fathers and rereading them and seeing how fresh and experiential their language was that, that it shot and rejuvenated the language of the council. Yeah, yeah I, no, I, I agree fully. Yeah, that's great. And I think that that is a nice way. You know, I had not really made that distinction between race or smut with a small r and race or, race or smut with a, with a big r. I've just always thought, OK, that's the kind of theology that takes us back to the sources. And, you know, we had ignored the fathers and scriptures. And so we're going to go back to that. Uh, but making that distinction that what Resource Month is ultimately after is the kind of repristinating of the Gospels, a, a repristinating of, of the evangelical figure of, of Christ. That's exactly it, I think. And that brings me, uh, actually, we're still sort of on page one here of, of your of your essay. Uh, we might have to do five or six shows to get through this, <laughs> all right? Uh, which is what always sorts of happens in these kinds of interviews. But you you point out that really, that the council was a Christological or Christocentric council. You call it the the depth grammar of the council, which be belies any facile separation of doctrinal and pastoral, uh, nor can the council be read as promoting a pastoral paradigm in opposition to a doctrinal paradigm. I was wondering if you could comment on that a little bit. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, as you, as you know, the uh, so many of the people who are interested in social justice, and, and obviously that's a legitimate and a necessary concern, uh, seem to focus exclusively on Gaudium et Spes and take that right. as their primary source. Now, in and of itself, that is one-sided. There are four constitutions, and they really... 
John O'Malley, the great historian, uh, made that point that they have to be read intertextually. There's there his book. Right. There's his right. book. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They have to be read intertextually so that you read one constitution with an eye on another constitution. So even in and of itself, that's short sighted. But what, what astonishes me, and this goes back to Larry's uh, blog title, is how much doctrine is in Gaudium et Spes. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I mean, not yeah. only 22, which is Larry's, you know, uh, preferred in a sense, uh, but 10 and 45. I'm astonished. I mean, uh, yeah. when you talk about spiritual reading, if, if you read uh, Lumen Gentium 10, which is the end of the introduction, and which was highly influenced, I understand, by Joseph Ratzinger, uh, you have a rich Christological statement but in very scriptural and very experiential terms. And then in 45, which is the end of the first part, which sets the tone for the second part, then the more practical issues, again, a, a magnificent expression of, uh, you know, Christ's you know, desire of all human hearts. Right, uh, right, right, so right. Basel the Great. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's drawing upon that. How uh, so? so how no, much? Just to, go ahead. I was just just to conclude. So the doctrine and the pastoral are so interwoven that uh, it, it's foolhardy to try to separate them. Because I think Larry said in his comment on uh, you know the article, uh, the pastoral, if it's going to be authentically pastoral, has to be doctrinally based. And the doctrine, if it's going to be truly ecclesial, has to have all sorts of pastoral implications. <laughs> Yes, yes. And I've never, I, I oftentimes I think that that distinction is made between doctrinal and pastoral in order to simply dismiss it as, oh, well, it's just pastoral, which means it's not infallible. And so we can just ignore the entirety of it. You see that distinction made all the time. And, and for and for that reason, um, I want to though go back to uh, something that you said about the, 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 uh, the, the depth grammar, the Christological death grammar, and 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 Gaudium et Spes twenty two, and the other Christ, Christocentric. Because I, I, I would say the council isn't just Christological. I, my view is that it's Christocentric, in in a mm. lot of ways. And yeah. uh, and I chose the reason why I chose Gaudium et Spes twenty two was because John Paul II made such liberal use of GS twenty two and all of his encyclical. And at one time, Rodney, weren't you and I going to start some sort of magazine a zine or whatever it was called gs22 so i have to admit i shamelessly stole that idea from you and did not give you proper attribution which i'm doing now here publicly <laughs> well better late than never no no <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah but you but father and billy is right i mean there are little christocentric little christological bombshells that are sort of littered throughout the document so it's simply a lie to say oh it's just in little isolated fragments here and there that were thrown in there as a kind of tokenism in the midst of all of this otherwise progressive ambiguity. It's, it's, it's nonsense. You're right. Lumen Gentium 10 and some of the, uh, and then Gaudium et Spes uh, 45. I mean, it's it, one wonders, and, I, and I'll pick your brain on this father and belly and Rodney, you might know about this too. How influential was Henry de Lubach in these, in these conversations? Oh, I, I think de Lubach, uh, de Lubach and Congar, I think are, are behind so much of the theological impetus for Vatican II. Uh, I mean, there were others, of course. Uh, I, I think uh, Guardini is in the background, but I think the the you know the people who really uh, influenced the mindset of the council, the Christological, Christocentric mindset, uh, were De Lubac and Congar. Uh, even though Congar, you know, is often spoken of as an ecclesiologist, and even if Vatican II is often spoken of as an ecclesial council, you begin Lumen Gentium Cordes Christus, you know, the light yeah. of the nations, yeah. In, yeah. which is Christ. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think that, you know, some of the phrases from de Lubach's Catholicism, I, I think, are found in Lumen Gentium, for example. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think that they are so instrumental, so key. Uh, and, I mean, yeah. not to anticipate a further discussion, uh, but I think uh, some of the uh, travails of the post-conciliar period was that uh, we have fallen from that uh, robust Christocentrism of the council. 
Yeah. yeah and uh, Rodney, I mean, you read the article. So there's a section in there, and I don't mind jumping ahead to this part where Father and Belly talks, uh, quoting Ratzinger and others, about the Christological amnesia. Uh, uh, I think he was in sort of a decapitation. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I, I call it sometimes the decapitated body, as though there was yeah. a body without a head. Yeah. yeah. So, so, Dr. Hauser, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, yeah, this really gets us to the heart of the matter. I mean, it, it's almost as if the the sort of, um, let's call them the traditional school at the council and the progressive school sort of both seem to agree that you have to kind of have one or the other. You have to have kind of another, uh, either a robust doctrinal position, right, a, a, you know, right, a right. thick of the faith, or you're, you can be open to the world. And, and it seems to me that the key to not making that either or is precisely found in the person of Jesus Christ, right? And this is De Lubac's genius uh, in, in Catholicism, you know, the, this, 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 that he's precisely wanting to open the church to the world, but not in any way, shape, or form uh, by ceasing to be church or whatever. I mean, Christ doesn't leave the bosom of the Father when he reaches out to the, the worst of sinners. What is, Schindler's, what is Schindler's books from the yeah, heart yeah, of the yeah, world yeah. to the center of the, center of the church, heart of the world. Yeah. Yeah. And just a, then a quick kind of maybe a more technical point is if I'm not mistaken, GS 22, Gaudium Espes 22 is a direct quote from Catholic. There is a, I think it's Catholicism has direct quote that it's only in the history of, of Christ. Yeah. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that's true. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. along the same lines, I think, uh, you know, one has to be aware, of course. I mean, you know, we're all finite and we can't, you know, cover every base, but there is selective uh, truncation. So, for example, signs of the times, you know, that's that becomes a watchword. But the council says signs of the times, reading the signs of the times in the light of the gospel. Yeah. And uh, right, again, right, 45, right. document express 45, as I mentioned, the end of the part one. And just before going into some of the more practical issues of part two, says reading the signs of the times in light of Christ. So, you know, what, what going back to O'Malley, he says, in a way, race or small, you know, of the three terms, race or small, adjournamental and change, race or small is the most important because it contains the criterion for evaluating the adjournamental and the change. That's okay. Yeah. Now, it's, it's just in, in your article, you say, quoting O'Malley, a giornamento, resource mod, and development. I assume that's what you mean when you say change right. here. Right. So, but, right. That's, but that's an interesting, that's an interesting switch in terminology, because isn't that sometimes precisely uh, part of the debate? In other words, what kind of change? I, I, is the change really a development in continuity, or does it represent a change that is a kind of rupture? Uh, do we... Do, and is resource mont itself open to, in some sense, a hermeneutic of reform that would embrace certain kinds of rupture? I think this uh, this is an interesting conversation. Anyway, do you want to comment on that, uh, Father and and Doctor Hauser? Yeah, I, I think you know Benedict the Sixteenth uh, when he gave that famous address to the Curia and you know spoke of uh, you know uh, continuity in reform. Uh, and he, he gave a couple of instances of, you know, the, the reform that he had in mind. I mean, in terms of our understanding of science, uh, you know, relationship with, uh, you know, non-Christian religions, uh, but always relying, it seems to me, upon the source who is Christ. So in, in other words, it is what we say about Christ, which authenticates these developments uh, and it's not, you know, separated from, you know, the the source who is Christ. Yeah, right. Yeah. Rodney, you want to say something to that? Yeah, no, that's that's it. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, I, you know, uh, Tom Gordino's book on, on the count. Uh, Gorino's book is Gorino. very helpful. I was just yeah, going to bring that up. So go ahead. So talk about this. Yeah, I find that his book very helpful. And he, he makes the distinction. Well, he, he says two things, you know, first of all, uh, all of the great 
doctors and, and fathers of the church acknowledge development, you know, that, that a dead thing grows, right? So they're, so they're, you know, so obviously like the use of homoousios in the fourth century was new in it. And and and, uh, and risky. It, well, it hadn't the, hadn't the, hadn't the term actually been rejected at one point? It, it, that's right, at a local council, I believe. Right. And yeah. Then, and then yeah. you know the uh, you know when Thomas went off to study uh, in Paris to, to to learn Aristotle, he was doing something pretty radical. You know, something a little woo, like this is this is edgy. You know, or whatever. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and great developments came out of, you know, the use of Aristotle in theology and things like that. They're very, I think, great advances, you know. So, um, so on the one hand, uh, you know, the faith as a mystery is always something that we're growing into, right? It's always something that we're catching yeah. up to in some sense. Yeah. It's given right. the beginning. We're always right. catching up to it. So it's always a room for development. Uh, and there is a kind of a mentality that wants to just stop history at some point and say this is where it should stay exactly like this and uh, and that's just not catholic i mean that you know that i mean luther in some sense wants to do that he wants to stop you know the, yeah. the early church you know boom you know whatever um but then the second point that guarino makes i think super helpful is there is valid also change there is novelty in the in the tradition because the ordinary magisterium Sometimes in the way it prudentially judges how a thing should be applied, it makes mistakes. Right. You know, the, yeah. the, the, yeah. the bunker mentality of the 19th century was not going to work for the for the 20th century. It just it just couldn't. And and so that was a a, a partial mistake of the ordinary magisterium. That's OK. You know, that's. Uh, well, uh, for, yeah. can I can I can I use it? Can I break in? And uh, I mean, there's a couple of examples with regard to Guarino's book that come to mind. The first would be, and this is not pertinent to Father's uh, essay here so much, but it is since we're de we're talking about the concept of development as one of the options that we're floating around there. Um, there's there's the issue of the doctrine of extra ecclesiam nulla salus. Right? There's no salvation outside of the church, and there's no doubt when you go back and you read the preponderance of the evidence, uh, you know, from various people, you know, a thousand years ago, and and. 600 years, that, that most people in the church, including popes, it, interpreted extra ecclesiam nulla salus very, very, very narrowly. All right? right. So now it seems like we're, we're, you know, interpreting it more maximally in the sense of giving people the benefit of the doubt, expanding our notion of, of, of what constitutes, say, the baptism of desire. Anyway, I don't want to dominate this conversation. The point is, what changed? What changed is our deepening understanding of of sociocultural factors, of the nature of human subjectivity, of realizing that this sort of very wooden sense of you've heard the gospel, you rejected it, you're going to hell now, or you've never heard of it, so you're probably going to be in limbo or something, is just not, it's not going to cut much. So there's an example, I think, of, of a certain definite rupture with the recent past in order to retrieve uh, a deeper aspect of the tradition. Of course, then the whole uh, dignitatis humanae and religious freedom, I think Guarino point blank says, yeah, that's pretty much a rupture with, say, the past four or 500 years of thinking on, on these issues uh, in, in the church. But it's a rupture that was attempting to retrieve something that had been lost that was in the tradition, namely the full dignity of human personhood. Uh, and what that entails, which is what sort of Rotzinger talks about. But anyway, I, I don't want to dominate the conversation. Any comments on any of that? Oh, uh, you know, Tom Guarino, who's uh, who's a good friend, uh, also makes a point. I mean, it's not directly related to what you just said, but but makes the interesting point that the council, quotes on quotes, did not reject Thomas Aquinas, uh, and what what he draws upon, especially, is the council's use of analogy which he thinks, right. you know, implicitly, you know, without them saying so, is rooted very much in uh, in Aquinas. And so, you know, even there you have a continuity which is uh, open to new developments. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, Rodney, why don't you talk a little bit, since you and I are both Balthasarians, and one of the things that race source Mont theology is often accused of is of having killed the Thomistic dragon and, you know, put, sent St. Thomas out to pasture. Let's just take Balthazar. What was Balthazar's? You're, you're more of an expert on Balthazar than I am. What was Balthazar's views on Thomas Aquinas? Yeah, it's funny. It's, it's of, of, you know, we tend to think, I think probably if people 
we're going to categorize, say, say Baltazar and Ratzinger, usually Ratzinger would be considered the more straight laced, the more quote conservative, perhaps. And Baltazar is a little bit more daring and and all of that stuff. But when it comes to Thomas, <laughs> I actually think Baltazar is much more Thomistic than Ratzinger, although Ratzinger has his Thomistic moments. He's more consistently Augustinian, I would say. And yeah, uh, yeah. But Baltazar, if you think about the philosophers who influenced Baltazar, uh, Josson, um, you know, uh, Seifert, uh, Seifert uh, Ulrich, uh, you know, yeah. all of these guys were to Javara. They were Javara. Thomists. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so now they were not, they were August, I would call them Augustinian Thomas, you know, right. They were, they were th th Thomas who hadn't separated Thomas as much from the patristic tradition as some sorts of Thomism, you know, so, right, so I, right. I don't, you know, I don't think in Balthazar, you get a rejection of Thomas, uh, you know, as much as you do get a rejection of certain sort of constricting of Thomas to exactly. a certain kind of you know, scholastic. Uh, I mean, Balthazar yeah. quotes Thomas Aquinas more than any other author in his trilogy. And then you oh, get to, yeah, he does. It's it's number he quotes Aquinas more than any other author in his trilogy, and then you get to a volume four of his theological aesthetic where he deals with you know modern philosophy. He's doing a whole sort of genealogy of modern philosophy. I mean, he gets to Heidegger, right? And he's got some nice things to say about Heidegger, but he ultimately critiques Heidegger using who Thomas Aquinas. Uh, on the yeah. and, he, and he considers Aquinas's distinction, you know, re, the real distinction, to be one of the greatest breakthroughs in the history of philosophical thinking. Now, this is a bit of a tangent, but it's not. It's meant to point out how uh, some of these categories of resource mont versus progressive versus Thomas and so forth can be a bit artificial, especially in light of the fact that resource mont is, in my opinion, a form of Thomistic thinking in some ways. Uh, and, and therefore, too much is, I think, often made. I was just talking before of rupture, but now I think too often is often made that there was this serious break with the church's Thomistic tradition, and I, I, I personally don't think that's true. No. So I thank no, you I for. Either. But let's, uh, unless somebody wants to comment more on that, I'd like to move on a little bit more. We're sort of getting, we have about a half hour left to to the rest of Father's essay here. Is that all right? That's Anybody? great. Okay. Um, because I, I would be remiss. I mean, we, we've sort of talked, we sort of anticipated certain things. Uh, oh, by the way, I have to say this too, before I go on, I was reading Peter Seewald's uh, biography of Pope Benedict. And there's a, a section in there on the council. I, I would highly recommend both volumes, by the way, there's a section in there in the council. And I never knew this, but I think it's hysterical, but it, I think it, it bears on our previous conversation that Pope John actually thought that the council would be very short, one session, after he read the various schemata that had been presented to him, uh, whether he read them all or not, I don't know. Uh, he exclaimed to his aides, this is fantastic. The council's darn near done. We'll be done and everybody will be home by Christmas, meeting in October, ending at Christmas. So, and yet this is the same Pope who then intervened as Father Mbele points out, to send De Verbum, in a sense, back to conference with a revised committee to, to take a look at it. Um, I don't know what I'm trying to say here, except that I think it's, it's pertinent to the idea that the council was a movement of the Holy Spirit, I think, that, uh, that, that the, the, the Pope was open to change, that the schemata though cast in stone apparently by the curial offices by Ottaviani, reached the floor of the council with a resounding thud. And most people said, yet, no, we're not going to do this. Um, I, and I just, I just think it's interesting. But anyway, Father, let me just oh, go, ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I have not read the Seawald biography. Uh, I must say, I was a little bit, uh, when, of course, when you remarked upon that in, uh, in your blog post, uh, I, I was a little bit uh, wondering, uh, because uh, just to relate an incident, uh, uh, as you know, Ratzinger was the paritas for Cardinal Fringe. Fringe, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and he, Ratzinger wrote for Fringe a, uh, uh, a speech, which... He gave prior the Gen to the Genoa Catholic speech, beginning. right? Yeah, is that right. the Genoa speech? Yeah, right. Which was very critical, as I take it, of the drafts you know that were being presented. 
And uh, John the 23rd then calls the cardinal in who thought that he was going to take away his cardinalate, uh, if that's the right word, cardinalship. <laughs> and uh, in, instead, John the 23rd was uh, delighted with this speech that was critical of the document. So I don't how, know how these two things square. That, that's my question. Yeah. I don't know either. And the fact is, I'm so glad that you brought this up. And it's one of the reasons why I raised it with you, because you, you know so much more about this this era than I do. Although I know I, I, I it's in Seawalt's biography of Benedict as such, where he mentions how happy John the 23rd was with the, the Genoa speech. Uh, and, and so I was thinking the same thing, even within the internal consistency of the Seawalt book. Well, which is it? Was John the Twenty Third already looking for a way out of the Ottaviani cage, or, 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 or was he simply thrilled that okay, Vatican One's now done? All of this talk about the need for a council is over. We'll just we'll vote on it. We'll be home by Christmas. Mm -hmm. I, I, Seawald has a bit of a liberal agenda, and so I, I'm I'm not entirely certain that everything that he writes in that biography is necessarily all that trustworthy. Not in the level of empirical fact, but in sometimes what he chooses, the facts right. he chooses to highlight. Anyway, Rodney, do you want to add something to that? Uh, no, I, I just remember reading the inter the, the last interview uh, Seabolt did with uh, with uh, Ratzinger with Benedict, right. and uh, and Benedict talks about he was so nervous after he had written that speech because he. He thought he was going to get his knuckle wrapped when he went in to see the Holy Father, but uh, but it was a very, he got good news. But I, I kind of find it so interesting, you know, uh, that when 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 Ratzinger was elected Pope, everybody's like, "Oh no, this conservative, you know, Pope." Uh, it just yeah. it, it's it's it, it really does speak to the final part of uh, Father Imbelli's uh, essay in, in Church Life Journal the part that talks about how after the council, there was a misremembering of it. And, and, yeah. and of course I, Benedict himself, who talked about, there were actually two councils. There was the actual council. And then there was the council council of the journalists who were, were hoping and praying that it was a progressive agenda was going to come out of it. And it's almost as if, and this might be something we could talk about. It's, 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 it's very sad because in, 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 um, you know, document after document at the council, there seemed to be a group that just didn't want any change, right? That just wanted things to be the same as ever. Right. And so they would threaten, with the idea of religious freedom, there was an entire group that like, we don't want to affirm uh, the right to religious freedom, you know? So that was, <laughs> we're not going to do it, right? And then of course, there's the group that's, oh, no, we need to affirm the right of religious freedom. But it seems to me, and I, and I, I don't know if I'm right about this, but it's, you know, the more I study this, the more I see, feel, I realize this, there's this group that kind of holds things together in every document that says, no, we can do this without selling the farm, you know, without losing the Christocentric center, without losing the tradition. And that group seems to prevail at the council in every document. But then what's tragic, it seems to me. And that group was the resource month. That group was the resource month group. I, I don't, okay. it's not special pleading. It's just a fact, right? And, and, yeah, and the yeah. thing is that after the council, what it seems is tragic to me is the people that got to interpret the council for us were not the resource month people, but it was more, the more progressive wing. Uh, it seems to me that, and that's what uh, you, you speak of this father as a, I, I wrote down some notes here, uh, Unitarianism of the spirit, uh, neglect of Jesus Christ, a soteriological relativism, liturgical horizontalism. It seems to me that those... <laughs> things triumphed for the most part after the council, in spite of the fact that race or response seems to me to have been the, the, the center of the council. I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn or if I'm wrong about that. But. No, I, I think that that remains to be, you know, the, the, the great, the great uh, conundrum of what happened. You know, as you, you both know better than I, you know, the 1972 uh, founding of the journal Communio, uh, you know, as you've said so often, uh, you know, Ratzinger and Balthazar were, de Lubach, were, were involved in the beginning of Concilium, you know, maybe not in a leadership role, but certainly in a supportive role. Uh, and within a few years, you know, decided that it was taking a wrong turn. And in a way, you can't blame the press for that. I mean, it was the, the actual theologians themselves. Uh, one of the things, uh, you know, just going back to the council a bit, uh, Tom Guarino, lords the uh, importance of Gerard Philippe, 
uh, who Monsignor Philippe, yeah, right, who sort of uh, negotiated amongst the diverging points of view, and and Tom thinks he did a magnificent job in reconciling and bringing forward so much so that he suffered a heart attack, I think, in '65. Uh, wow. So you know, the mystery is, you know, what what caused the split. I mean, just to speak personally, you know, if anything, in the late '60s and early '70s. Uh, I did my uh, doctoral work at Yale, which was one of the first uh, uh, cohorts of Catholics who were going to study theology at a secular university. Uh, and I was around Aryan, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. until you know the mid-70s when uh, it just seemed to me that those people that I called the Ranarians of the left prevailed. And... Uh, I was looking for, you know, a more Christocentric foundation and found it in Balthazar and, 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 and Ratzinger. So when I started teaching at Dunwoody in 1970, uh, I may have been one of the first people in the States to use uh, Introduction to Christianity as uh, a textbook <laughs> in, the, uh, in the seminary. It's a phenomenal uh, book. The of that, you know, where he talks about, uh, you know, the... Uh, 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 unlucky Hans, who trades, you know, the gold which he had, yeah, uh, it winds up with a stone which he just a little away. stone. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's and, uh, yeah. So well, Rotsky was saying that in 1969. Yeah. Well, and, and if so, you if you uh, go all the way back to his 1958 article, uh, the new paganism in the church, uh, he's also, I mean, that was sort of the bombshell that announced the arrival of the young father, Joseph Ratzinger onto the theological mm -hmm. scene when he writes mm -hmm. this bombshell article in 1958 saying all is not well in the church folks. There's a kind of paganism in the church, which is something that I always like to bring up because, and it relates to a question that I now have for, for both of you, which is, and it relates to what you were, we were just talking about, about the, uh, sort of appropriation of the council and what happened after the council. In my in my blog post, I note, in, in commenting on your essay, I note, and, and it's a purely hypothetical, but I think it's a hypothetical worth talking about. Even if there had been no Second Vatican Council, and all we had was this sort of neo-scholastic edifice and some progressives in the academy, would the church have still undergone a similar sort of decline and turmoil as we saw in the 60s and 70s anyway? And my claim is that, yes, the council acted as an accelerant to combustibles that were already there, but some other event, maybe not quite as dramatic or sudden, would have lit those combustibles. What, what do you gentlemen, fine gentlemen, think of my thesis? Rodney, I'll let you speak. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm just reminded all of a sudden of uh, uh, Father Giussani, uh, you know, Luigi Giussani's uh, comments about, I think he was on a boat or maybe a bus, uh, and he heard some young Catholic schoolboys talking about a teacher who had kind of rattled their faith. You know, they, they had been in class and this he was a upstart, probably an existentialist atheist or something. And he made some criticisms of Christianity, which were pretty thin. They weren't very substantial, but the kids were totally shaken to the core because their faith was so <laughs> it's just like a cardboard box. It was yeah. just like poof and it's gone, right. And, and he realized that there was a crisis. This was in the 50s, that there was a kind of memorization of the thing. There was a kind of a notional ascent to borrow from Newman, but not right. a realist. And that, that there was a crisis. And I actually think, Larry, to, to take your hypothetical situation a step farther, I might even suggest that were it not for the council, things It'd would have be gotten worse. worse. This is my I, point. I think they yes. Because, yeah, because I think then all of these new things coming in would have come in without any response from the church at all. And individual Catholics would have just been overwhelmed, I think. I, I, at, you know, well, yeah, yeah, because yeah, my hobby horse is that the problem is sort of Western technocratic bourgeois capitalism, whatever buzzword you want to toss in there. Uh, and I mean, a, a case in, a case study would be modern day Poland, which was, you know, under Soviet domination well through the conciliar years and into, you know, until the Iron Curtain fell. And then immediately after that, there was a wave of, you know, love for the church, solidarity, you know, Valenza, Valenza John Paul, that. But now we see that Catholicism is going the way of essentially Ireland in Poland. 
as the entire new young generation coming up is simply falling prey to Western style. I saw this in Krakow when I was there in a conference 10 years ago. I was amazed at how secularized the young people there were. Um, and so, yeah, so I think you're 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 absolutely right, uh, Dr. Hauser. I think that in some ways, I think the situation would be worse had there never been a council uh, because all we wouldn't have the resources to deal with it. But anyway, before we get out of here, Father, do you want to say something more on that before I want to I want to get onto your Paschal mystery stuff in your essay here? Yeah, well, why don't we why don't we get on to that again? I uh, I remember, uh, you know, I grew up as an altar server in the 1950s, uh, and we, you know, at the beginning of the 1950s, we celebrated uh, the Holy Saturday uh, in the early morning hours of Saturday, uh, and uh, by noon uh, the resurrection was proclaimed. Noon on Saturday, so we had really yeah. lost the sense of the Shalom. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I just find it incomprehensible how, you know, some on the on the right will criticize Pius XII for uh, 19, yeah. interfering with the uh, Triduum, whereas uh, it, it, I, I'm not a historian, but it seems to me that it was uh, it was a restoration of, uh, of of what had been and what should be. Well, yeah. So yeah. I think that. Th that begins the, the sort of pastoral retrieval, if you will. Uh, the year 1961, 62, I was uh, a seminarian at Dunwoody, and uh, three books uh, were for me almost like novitiate reading uh, that year. Uh, one of them was Dorwell's The Resurrection, yeah, which yeah. almost came as a revelation. Uh, again, we, we can't generalize from our particular experiences, but I grew up in what was called an Italian national parish. And almost every weekday mass was was black. I mean, it, at age uh, 11, I could recite the Dies Irae by heart uh, because I heard it so many times serving mass. Uh, and so for Durwell then to uh, bring out, I mean, talk about race or small, uh, the importance of resurrection. Uh, mm -hmm. And so in the article, I mentioned how, uh, again, this I'm relying upon other people, but that, uh, uh, in uh, Mediato Dei of Pius XII, there's no reference to uh, pastoral mystery, and it just flourishes at Vatican II. And people like Duowell and people like Bouillet, I think, you know, were the people who uh, set the stage for that by, you know, their their hard retrieval, their race or small. It's interesting. Yeah. So uh, I want to bring up the fact that my former colleague here. And it relates to what you just said, Father, uh, Dr. Rodney Hauser <clears throat> is a former Protestant. Rodney is a, a convert, right? You started as, what, Assemblies of God? Or you went to an Assemblies of God school. I don't know. Uh, these things are very yeah. fluid. I, I Pardon my ignorance. <laughs> and then you became, what, Presbyterian, then Anglican, and then finally Catholic when you were at Marquette. Okay. And what, what, what strikes me though, okay, so Bouillet, Father mentioned Louis Bouillet, and Bouillet yeah. was instrumental in the recovery of this sense of Paschal mystery uh, and, and among uh, many other things. I'm, I'm a huge Bouillet fan. But Bouillet is a convert. And there, I, I, I'm asking this because I want you to refresh my memory. Hanso is von Balthasar at some point is cataloging various, and maybe it's the, the fathers of scholastics and ourselves and us, I don't know. But he associates himself more with Bouillet and, and, and the converts than he does with the resource Montcamp as such. Do you remember that? I do. Th this is a speech that I believe he gave at Catholic University of America that was, I think he calls it current trends in theology or, or something like that. And he, that's it. And the trend. Yeah. Yeah. The, <clears throat> the trends, if I remember kind of off the top of my head are sort of what we would maybe call transcendental Thomism. On the, uh, you know, so that would be one school. The other school would be Ray Sorsmont, and there he mentions De Lubac and Daniel Liu and all those guys. And then he mentions this third school, which I didn't know was a school, but uh, but it's Bouillet. Uh, it's is it Schlier, the the New Testament scholar, Heinrich Schlier, right? Who, who, if I'm not mistaken, was also a convert. Yes. Uh, and, and there was another person who's a scripture scholar, uh, Sherman, maybe uh, or somebody like Hein Sherman, if, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. who was the yeah. who was a who's a scripture scholar. And I think maybe what he's getting at there is 
this uh, evangelical in the European sense of the word, this big right, e right, evangelical right. there, which is precisely on the Paschal mystery. It's, uh, you know, and it's funny because yes. um, it's both, you know, you, you see it to some degree in Luther and Calvin, right? Uh, 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 but um, I think what happens to a lot of Protestants is when they end up reading the Eastern Fathers, they see this something that really resonates with them, like the full-bodied soteriology that's there that includes mm -hmm. ascension and resur resurrection and ascension, you know, all those things. Are, it's not just the cross. It's, it's, it, it's, it's the whole Paschal mystery. And I think guys like Bouye, uh, that's what kind of brought him out of Protestantism was that fuller soteriology, if you want to call it, that includes not just the cross, but also the resurrection, the ascension, you know, et, et cetera. And, and Father, that, that part of the essay was my favorite. That was beautiful, uh, beautiful yeah. stuff. On, I think that's so helpful. And I didn't know, here I am, you know, confess, I didn't realize that it was such a novelty, the, the expression Mysterium Pascale, that was a, a, a relative novelty. You know what? It's amazing. That's, that's a great point. I did not know that either. I did not know. I assumed it was in Mystici Corpus Christi from Pius the Twelfth. Yeah, because I read it in Vatican II, Pascal Mystery, and I knew it wasn't much in the Neo Scholastics. But I thought, well, it's probably in Mystici Corpus Christi. <laughs> I seem to remember reading that at some point, but it, but it wasn't. It wasn't. It was. It was a. So can, maybe you can speak to that, Father, about the, why it is that the Second Vatican Council sort of invented this term, the Paschal Mystery. Well, as I you know, as I've indicated before, and once more, I, I don't claim to you know be you know, the authority on this, but uh, relying upon other people, uh, I think that the resurrection had, you know, really fallen off the, the radar in a sense. I mean, not that it was ever denied, of course, and, you know, it was, Easter was celebrated, uh, but it was so focused on the passion of Christ. And, and I think this in Thomas Aquinas as well. Uh, but whatever, I mean, Thomas also has a salvific meaning of resurrection and ascension. Uh, but but it became narrowed. I think Eucharist became narrowed merely to the memorial of the Passion, uh, without adequate attention to the fact yeah. that what, who we receive is the risen, ascended Lord, who still bears the the wounds of His Passion. Uh, so again, it was a uh, a valid insight that became too narrow. It seems to me, uh, and that's why. Dorwell, at least for me, broke upon the scene as, as a real revelation. Now, what I've also claimed is that, nonetheless, we still fail to do justice to the ascension. Uh, and uh, I, I think that is one of the tasks that your generation and the generation behind you, you know, have to assume, the, the importance of the ascended Lord. Because it's the ascended Lord. Uh, I, I have a quote there from uh, Paul Griffiths. In, in the article, quote. but it is a wonderful quote. I mean, that uh, the, the, the condition for the possibility of the liturgy is the ascended Lord, you know, yeah. that he is offering, you know, the eternal sacrifice to the Father. And if you will, it's not the best expression. We plug into that. At every <clears throat> uh, I would just, if I may, add one thing to what Rodney was saying about, um, and I find that interesting. I'd like to see that article by von Balthasar. But associating himself with Bouillet and uh, you know, oh what, yeah, uh, but because it's liturgically based, so uh, you know th this rich soteriology uh, retrieved from the Eastern Fathers, and you know, and 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 from the Western Fathers, nonetheless is enacted liturgically, and, and I I think this is what uh, appeals to me so much about Bouillet, uh, you know that that sense of the uh, the liturgy as the matrix then of our theologizing and our pastoral practice Absolutely. and why, you know, this, the loss of, uh, you know, Eucharistic sensitivity uh, as, for example, on the part of people who are no longer attending the Eucharist uh, is, is really a tragedy and, and, you know, that we have to address however we can. Yeah. yeah, you know, uh, uh, you mentioned Charles Taylor, and he even says we need to have a recovery of this sense of theosis. I mean, there's there's broad ecumenical, you know, implications of this retrieval of the ascension and the whole Paschal mystery uh, with the East, and uh, and I I like what you say in here about how the ascension, in a sense, bursts 
our, in a sense, our slavery to the imminent frame, the imminent frame of our existence. I, I think that was just a magnificent way to sort of conclude to conclude your article. And I love the fact that you bring in Charles Taylor as well. I have certain issues with Charles Taylor, but man, he, he's got so much that's there. Uh, where where he taught you talk about the social imaginary, and right. and what we need now is a sort of new ecclesial imaginary. And as right. you said, probably a generation after after me, and <laughs> maybe even Rodney, he's a little younger than I am is going to have to pick up the mantle of, de <laughs> of developing this new ecclesial imaginary uh, for, you know, for really driving home the message of the Second Vatican Council and the Paschal Mystery. Gentlemen, this has been great. Uh, Rodney, you want to add anything? We're, we still have a little bit of time, but uh, I want to keep this around an hour. We don't want to tax everyone's patience who's, who's watching this. Anybody? No, I just am I just want to say I'm honored to be a part of this. Uh, Father Mbelli, I've been a big fan of yours for a long time, and uh, it's nice to finally uh, kind of meet you a little bit face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, uh, uh, and uh, hopefully I'll see you at uh, the Academy of Catholic Theology this coming. Uh, this coming. And you know what? <clears throat> I was one of the founding members, as you were too, Rodney, of the Academy. And uh, But when I started my Catholic worker farm and retired from teaching theology, I quit going. Uh, because I can't attend the meetings in May, cause, but I, I'm really thinking strongly of going this year. So uh, maybe maybe we can all meet up. I don't know. There may be COVID restrictions or something. I don't know. But I will end with a Father and Belly praise as well here, which is I've been a fan of Father and Belly's for a long time as well, his his writings and and uh, so I remember one day shortly after my blog got started, I got an email. And it said, you know, from Father in Belly. And I thought, well, that's it. And he said, yeah, I'm reading your email. I'm reading your blogs and I, and I kind of like them. So keep up the good work. That's when I knew that I had arrived. I, I, I said to my <laughs> wife, I said to my wife, Carrie, I said, Father in Belly wrote, said he likes the blog. I, I'm good. I'm good now. I, I, I can take my critics. So thank you for that. Uh, little things like that. You never know how they affect people. I really appreciated that. Right, right, right. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you, me, gentlemen. Just, Go uh, ahead, Father. Can yes. I add, can I add this? Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned in uh, the blog, uh, quoting Shmemon, getting back to liturgy, uh, homo adorans. Uh, mm. Yeah. And, and I, the, the, the issue, finally, of, of worship is, uh, is key. Uh, speaking of blogs, aside from yours, uh, I don't know if you know the blog by Bishop Eric Vaden, who's bishop in Norway. No. He has a blog called Corum Fratribus, which is wonderful. Comes out every Monday, has some reflections of his own. Uh, well, they're all reflections of his own, but some of them might be the homily he preached the day before, but wonderful. But what's his, end, what's, his, what's his name? Uh, Bishop Eric Vaden, V-A-R-D-E-N, and the blog is Corum Fratribus. He had been a, a Benedictine monk uh, and then was made Bishop of uh, Trondheim in Norway. But at the end of uh, one of his uh, blogs, and, you know, talking about worship and uh, how a robust Christology, he says, uh, and talking about the, the sort of uh, uh, liberal theological reductionism of Jesus Christ to, you know, uh, uh, superstar, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, but he said, the question is, you know, on Christmas, are we singing, come let us adore him or happy birthday? <laughs> that is perfect. I like that. I wish I had written that. That's brilliant. <laughs> and now I can't even steal it with that attribution because it's now publicly out there. Thank you, Father. But no, that's all joking. Is that That's that is perfect. That is an. I have to read this uh, bishop's blog because that sounds, that sounds great. On that note, Father and Belly, uh, thank you so much. First off, for for writing this article, which I just thought was um, fantastic. Uh, it just was. I mean, it's not very long, and yet it just packs right in there a lot of things that need to be said, especially in this current climate today, where the council is under such such criticism. And uh, Dr. Hauser, always great to see my old friend my old colleague, and I'm sure. Hey, by the way, the next time you have a communio study circle, don't forget to email me, all right? Anyway, yeah, hey, and uh, thanks to all of my uh, viewers. This was the inaugural one. I hope you liked it, and uh, we'll, we'll go from here. Thanks a lot. Now I'm